Hey, have you ever seen or heard of the 1955 classic film Marty starring Ernest Borgnine? Marty's in his 30s, he's a butcher, he's a bachelor, and he still lives at home with his mother in the Bronx, New York. He goes out on the weekends with his loser friends to try to meet girls. And on this particular weekend, they decide to go to the Stardust Ballroom. Marty encounters a weeping Clara, who's been referred to as plain and ordinary looking. She'd just been stood up by her blind aid, and Marty consoles her. They spend the rest of the evening dancing and talking, and Marty walks Clara home, and along the way they stop at his apartment and meet his mother. Things go very well, and they make plans to see each other the next day. In the morning, Marty is walking on air. He's so happy that he met somebody nice. But his family and friends, out of pettiness and fear of losing Marty to this young lady, discourage him from seeing her again. They deride her as unsuitable for him and ugly. Stupidly, he heeds their advice and doesn't call her. Later that day, while hanging out with his friends, he finally comes to his senses and tells them all to get lost and runs to a payphone to call her. What am I, crazy or something? I got something good here. What am I hanging around with you guys for? What's the matter with you? Wait a minute, will you? Marty, what's the matter, Marty? What's the matter with you? You don't like her. My mother don't like her. She's a dog and I'm a fat, ugly man. Well, all I know is I had a good time last night. I'm going to have a good time tonight. If we have enough good times together, I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to beg that girl to marry me. If we make a party on New Year's, I got a date for that party. You don't like her. That's too bad. The film ends on a sweet note with Marty on a payphone and speaking to Clara and hopefully things will work out between them. What does this have to do with home audio? Well, hopefully by the end of this video, it will make sense. I now have a My Own Devices website at davidcutter.com. You can see all my videos there and actually read my reviews. My website also displays my Instagram feed, which is my own dot devices. The Morans versus Sansui rivalry started in the early 70s. The two companies duked it out for the hearts and wallets of the hi-fi buying public. Even after the four plus decades that have passed, the rivalry among fans of those two brands still exists and is going strong. My first receiver was a Morant, and I suppose you could say that I'm a Morant's guy. Well, this is my current situation. I've owned two Morant's receivers for a while, but over the past few weeks, I've had the opportunity to obtain a couple of vintage Sansui receivers. So I figure since I have both brands now, it's time to do a head-to-head -head comparison of my own. I know these are just two particular models and you can't necessarily decide which brand is actually best using such a small product sample, but what the hell, I'm going to do it anyway to satisfy my own curiosity. I'm going to refer to the Morantz as the defending champ because I've had it the longest and I'm kind of attached to it. Now it's rated at 70 watts per channel and its unique features are that it has preamp inputs and outputs and the ability to handle two turntables. The Sansui is the challenger because it's the newcomer to my house. Now this model is rated to produce up to 63 watts per channel and its unique features are that it has two useful auxiliary inputs and can handle up to three pairs of speakers. For this evaluation, my analog source will be this Technics SL1300 with an Audio Technica cartridge. The digital source is title streaming through a Mac Mini via SPDIF coaxial output, and the D to A conversion is handled by a Shit Modi 2 Uber. My reference speakers are these Proac Response 2.5s. They are two way rear ported floor standards with 3 quarter inch domed fabric tweeters and seven inch carbon fiber impregnated paper woofers. These are old, but still fantastic high-end models. Before I discuss the particular audio qualities of these two receivers, I want to take a closer look at their physical appearance and their designs. Why? Because in my opinion, one of the main reasons you buy a 40 or 50 year old audio component is for their incredible 1970s style looks. And of course, sound quality is of high importance, and the old circuits in these units 
certainly have a tonal quality of their own that would be hard to duplicate today. During the silver-faced receiver era, Morantz was really hard to beat. They found a winning look and fundamentally stuck with it throughout the decade with only a few noteworthy updates. The first thing that strikes me is its bilateral symmetry. By bilateral, I mean if you divide the fascia vertically in half, the right and left sides are essentially mirror images of each other. What differences that do exist, like the smooth gyro touch tuning wheel on the right, is balanced by the tuning meters on the left. The power button on the right is different than the other mic and headphone jacks, but it's the same size and doesn't interfere with the symmetry. The beautiful brushed aluminum faceplate is totally flat, with four small metal screws in the corners. At the top is the black silkscreen Marantz emblem, which is still in use today. It is proudly emblazoned top and center, with the model number and component category flanking it, written in an elegant script. There is a row of 12 identically sized aluminum buttons, three groups of four, below the recessed black plastic radio dial. They are grouped somewhat logically, but since they are all the same size, their importance or usefulness is harder to determine. Below are six machined aluminum knobs, and they are of similar appearance at first look, but the symmetry is compromised by the three tone control knobs that are split to enable separate right and left tonal balance. To me, this feature is of dubious utility and unnecessary. Because the knobs are similarly sized, hierarchy cannot be visually detected, so you must read the labels. But the most important controls receive the Morantz logo font for their label, and the rest of the lettering is just all the same. This unit has incandescent bulbs which retain the original blue-green glow. I'm not a big fan of, of the looks of some LED bulbs that look violet or purple. Overall, to me, the 2270 represents the peak of Morant's design. The updates that followed were fine, but in my opinion, this model generation had the, has the greatest visual appeal. Now I'll give the Sansui a similar visual going over. And oh dear, it appears that the Sansui's design philosophy is completely different. Rather than stylish and sleek, we have a rather bulky, wide, and non-symmetrical faceplate. It's a bit of a hodgepodge, design-wise. I see three different metallic and two different plastic textures on the front. There's matte, there's shiny, and brushed metal. The plastic on the dial is glossy, but the horizontal strips, top and bottom, have a matte finish. The Sansui emblem is a naff small plastic strip that is positioned off-center for some reason. Why wasn't more effort made there? There are eight aluminum push buttons grouped as three on the left and five on the right. It also sports four different size shiny plastic knobs, all with facets for easier grip when turning, rather than the machined smooth aluminum on the Morantz. There is some logical hierarchy to their sizes, the largest being the most important knobs and so on. The smallest is the little microphone level knob, which I'm sure isn't used very often. The only element that is centered is the actual radio dial, but not much else balance or symmetry is going on here. You know, sometimes you need to just step back and look at it as a whole unit because just by looking at all the little details, you could be missing the big picture or overall theme that ties it all together. Hmm, I don't see it. I would describe it simply as functional and utilitarian. Sansui made some better design choices before and after this generation receiver and did have more frequent and significant changes to their appearance than Morantz. However, I do like its colors. Where the Morantz is cool and sleek, the metallic finish of the Sansui has a slightly warmer tone to my eyes. The radio dial is really easy to read and has a pleasant row of gold numbers and dots along the bottom. Looking behind the front surfaces, the Sansui's case is thin plywood that's wrapped in a wood grain vinyl that doesn't look terrible and may fool some people to believe it's actual veneer from a distance. The Morantz has a steel case that is covered with an atrocious wood grain vinyl that won't fool a soul and I'm sure wasn't designed to. But you can buy a variety of attractive real wood veneer cases to go over it. So after all this, do you want me to continue 
with a lengthy explanation of my methodology of how I came to my particular judgment? No, I don't think so. Let me say here up front, I like them both. They are high quality units and I now know why they have such passionate fans. Are these state-of-the-art audiophile grade components? No. And I don't even think they were considered that back in the mid-70s when they were new. They are somewhat upgraded mainstream brands and units. I admit I was likely biased while I was doing this. As I said earlier, I considered myself part of the Moran's camp. I listened and listened, switching between them frequently. I listened critically for extended and shorter periods, loudly and as quiet background music. I tried to A-B them on particular musical passages in an attempt to logically left-brain this and analyze which one sounds best using a predetermined set of criteria. Doing all that, I could probably say now that the Moran sounds best. It ticks most all the boxes in terms of sound quality, dynamics, and looks. But I have to give the right side of my brain its due respect and give my feelings on this subject equal time. Recalling my reaction when I first brought the Sansui home after being repaired, I remember being struck by how nice it sounded. It was the bass and mid-range of the Sansui that won me over. You could say that the Marantz's uh, high frequencies and dynamics were a bit better and better defined, but the Sansui just had a beautiful tone that was seductive to me, and it really just made me feel happy when I listened to it. I don't care how goofy you look, Sansui, because my heart says, you're the one for me. And as they say, beauty is only tin deep. <laughs>